All right, everybody, welcome back. Um, today, we've got a fun session, both for you and for me. So we're gonna do some more interactive work in ArcGIS. Um, so a couple of quick announcements before I get started, if I could have everyone's attention. All right, thank you. Uh, homework two, as you know, is due tonight at 11.59 p.m. If you have any last minute questions about homework two, come see me in office hours. I'll be there from approximately 5.30 to 6.30 uh, today uh, to answer any last questions that you have about homework two. Homework three will be assigned either tonight or tomorrow. And that uh, I believe will be due in about two weeks from today. Uh, and that's going to be primarily on ArcGIS and HEC HMS. Um, on a related note, we will be doing another in-class exercise with HEC HMS next week, starting on Tuesday. Uh, so you will need to download and install HEC HMS on your computer as well. So I will post an announcement with instructions for how to do that uh, after class today. Okay, and finally, uh, we're going to be having an in-class activity uh, on ArcGIS today. So I have a in-class worksheet today that I've posted under Canvas files slash activities slash um, ArcGIS in-class activity. So this is the activity here. Um, this is a graded in-class activity. So you will complete these questions in your group. There's about five questions here. Uh, it shouldn't take too long. Um, so after the lecture portion of today's class, uh, you will turn in these questions um, to Gradescope. So I have a Gradescope assignment set up here for ArcGIS and class activity. Okay, and these will sub be submitted. So just one submission per group. Uh, and they're just very short answer questions, okay? And I have that set up to be due uh, Friday evening, just in case you don't have enough time today, okay? Are there any questions before I move on? Any questions? Any questions about ArcGIS installation? Any ArcGIS questions? Yes. So I have the recording up on Canvas uh, that you can watch. I don't have written material on it, no, but I do have the recording, yeah. Okay. All right, any other questions? Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. So I have ArcGIS opened up here on my computer. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna open up the tutorial that we created last time. So this is leaving off from Tuesday's session. Okay, and uh, just so that we are all on the same page, I have a couple different data sets loaded in here already. Uh, I have the US states shapefile. I have uh, these precipitation bands. This is another shapefile. Uh, I have this impervious area data set. So this is a raster. And I have this urban area shapefile. Okay, so those are the those are the files that we left off with last time. Um, I have posted all of these links to all of these files under pages. If you go to pages, GIS data links, uh, links to all of those files that we've used are here under GIS data sets in this first uh, set here. Um, we're going to be using an additional data set today, um, two actually, but right now I'm just gonna download this Texas land cover data set. So go ahead and also download that if you haven't done so. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and load that up into ArcGIS. Um, I actually have it already on my computer, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. Okay. So we're also going to be using this today. And that is under Texas land cover. Take a second to load. Okay, so on Tuesday's lesson, oh yes, you will also need 
Uh, one second. It's a smaller file, but you'll also need digital elevation data, Austin area. Yeah, these first six you will need. So you will need uh, all of these for today. Okay, and I've gone ahead and loaded up that land cover data set. So this um, is a raster of land cover data for Texas. We're gonna be using this a little later on. I just wanted to download it and show you. It contains essentially uh, pixels with the different land cover types you know, uh, across Texas. Okay, so we'll be looking at that a little bit later. Okay, so in the last class, I wanted to give you kind of a broad overview of geographic information systems, um, what they're for, um, how we can kind of just use the ArcGIS interface. So I showed you how we can load up ArcGIS, install ArcGIS. Uh, I showed you how to explore different base maps. Uh, I showed you how we could add data to our map. Um, and then I discussed two different types of GIS data. Does anyone remember what the two major types of GIS data are? Yes. Raster and vector. Can anyone explain to me what the difference is between raster and vector data? Anyone wanna try to explain what the difference is between raster and vector data? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's exactly right. So uh, a vector data set, this would be an example of a vector data set here. So it represents geometries in kind of a similar way that you might see in AutoCAD. It's a collection of points or vertices connected by lines and they can represent either uh, individual points, they can represent lines or they can represent polygons. Um, and raster data sets on the other hand are essentially images that consist of pixels where each pixel uh, has a value that corresponds to something, for instance, uh, land cover uh, or impervious area, or as we'll see later on today, uh, digital elevation. Uh, so we're gonna be taking a look at digital elevation today. Okay. Um, so I also showed you a couple other features in ArcGIS. I showed you how we could kind of explore some of these data sets. Uh, I showed you how we could examine attributes of these data sets using an attribute table, how we could select different elements in our data set. Um, so here I've selected Austin, Texas. Uh, and I showed you how we could change the display of these data sets using the symbology uh, feature in ArcGIS. Okay, so we can change the symbology. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to change the color to purple. So that's a little bit hard to see. Okay, here we go. And at the very end of class, last time I gave a challenge problem um, in which I asked if you could find the average percent impervious area for an urban area in Texas. Did anyone did anyone complete this challenge problem? Anyone complete the challenge problem? Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, just show you before we kind of get into the main part of today's lecture, uh, I'm going to show you how we can complete that problem. So the idea here is we wanted to find an urban area in Texas, and we wanted to compute the average percent impervious area for that urban area. Okay, so I'm just gonna select Austin here. So we can do this in a couple of different steps. Uh, I'm gonna show you these steps because they'll be useful for what we're gonna be doing later on today. Um, but first, let's just select a, let's just select a city in Texas. So I've selected Austin, Texas here. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and export this to its own layer. Okay, so I'm gonna do layer from selection and it looks like it successfully exported the layer. So there's no other urban areas on this map. Okay, so what I did was I, I clicked on this layer. I went to data layer from selection after selecting the city of Austin and it created this uh, isolated layer that just contains Austin on it, okay? The next thing that I'm going to do, I'm gonna open up this impervious area data set. And what I'm going to do is essentially I'm going to try to clip this raster 
to Austin. Okay, so we can do that using a tool in the analysis toolbox. So I'm gonna go up to analysis here in this ribbon. I'm gonna click on this toolbox and I'm going to use a function called extract by mask. So I gave this as a hint last time. Uh, we're going to use it now. Okay, so I'm gonna select our input raster as Texas impervious area. Uh, and for our mask, I'm going to use that selection that I created that contains just the city of Austin. So CB 2018 US UA 10 500K selection. So that is the shape file containing just Austin. Okay, and the rest of this looks okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit run. And it may take a minute or so because the raster is a little bit large. Uh, did anyone have trouble finding any of those functions? Uh, let me just take a look. Yes. Right. So I just kind of zoomed in on the map and just clicked on it with the select feature. Uh, but you don't have to choose Austin. You can choose another city and just select it. Okay, so it successfully ran extract by mask. So it gave us this new raster extract TX. So I'm gonna go ahead and just show that. Okay, so this is our clipped raster. This is our clipped raster. So it's the uh, impervious area clipped to just Austin. And we can find the average percent impervious area as follows. We right click on this new layer and we go to properties. Then we can go to source statistics. Okay. And what it'll show here is some summary statistics of that raster that we computed. I see some, some uh, confused faces here. So what I did was after I extracted this uh, clipped raster, I went over here to the new clipped raster over here in the uh, data sets panel. I right clicked it and I went to properties. Okay, once you're in properties, you go to source, statistics, and you can see what the mean and standard deviation of the uh, raster are. In this case, because each pixel represents the percent impervious area, we can see that the average percent impervious area for Austin is about 32%. Yes. So, so in the very first part, what I did uh, was I took our initial urban areas data set um, and I just used select over here, select by rectangle, and I just clicked on Austin because I just, I uh, could see that this was Austin here. So you can do this for any city that you want. So I selected it, then I went to data. Um, and then with this layer selected over here on the left, I went to layer from selection. Okay. So you'll be using this procedure later on when we get into our uh, main topic for today. So I wanted to make sure you had this procedure uh, outlined for you. Yes. So you can look at the attribute table of this raster, but it's not going to be very helpful. So it gives you the count of each um, pixel value in the attribute table. It's much easier in this case, just to, um, just to look at those summary statistics because it's computed for you already. Okay, but you could theoretically use this attribute table to also compute the average, yeah. Yes. So to get the statistics, I went to properties. So I clicked on my extracted raster. I went to properties. I went to source and then statistics here. Okay. Yes. So it was using the extract by mask function. Yeah. Yes. Just say yes. 
Okay. Oh, yes, Mark. Can you show the parameters that you use to extract that mask? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to cover this for about 5 extra minutes and then I'm going to move on to our main topic for today. Um, but to do the extract by mask, I went to searched extract by mask. I selected extract by mask. The input raster is impervious area and the mask is our selection from the urban areas data set containing just Austin. And that's all I did. And then I hit run. Yes. How do you get that search process? Right. So to get this, what I did was I clicked, I went under analysis in here in the ribbon and I clicked on tools. And then there should be a search bar right here under, under geo processing. Yes. Okay. So I'll give you about uh, I'll give you about until um, 10 before. And then I'm going to transition into our main topic for today. Uh, which is watershed delineation. Okay. So make sure that you have the Austin DEM small data set downloaded. If I could have your attention, please. Thank you. So, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. Um, for this next part, you're going to need this data set, digital elevation data, Austin area. So, I'm going to go ahead and download this. Um, okay, so it appeared in my downloads folder, Austin DEM small. I'm going to go ahead and extract it. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add this layer to the map. So I'm going to go under add data. I'm going to find my downloads folder. I'm going to refresh. I'm going to go find Austin DEM small. And I'm going to click to load Austin DEM small .tiff. Okay, and it might give you a message about needing to build pyramids. So just say yes. So this basically just has to do with how it draws to the screen. Uh, and I can explain what pyramids are if you're interested uh, after after class. Okay, so we've loaded this data set. Does anyone have any idea what this is? Yes, <laughs> that's always a good guess for this class. You can always just say watershed and 80% uh, of the time you'll be right. Uh, yes. That's probably also true, but what this is, and I will, I'll, I'll spoiler you here. Uh, this is a digital elevation data set. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to kind of change the colors here to make it a bit more intuitive what this is. So I'm going to go to symbology and I'm going to change the color scheme. Uh, and let's get a nice elevation um, scheme here. I'm going to pick elevation number one. OK, that, that looks nice. And I'm going to go to uh, standard deviation as the stretch type. OK. I right clicked the layer over here on the left and I went to symbology. And then it appears over here on the right. And the color scheme I set to elevation. You can set it to what you want. But let's talk a little bit about what this is. So this is a digital elevation raster. What that means is that each pixel in this raster represents the elevation of that pixel above sea level. OK, so if I click on one of these brown pixels here, you see this has an elevation of about 319, I believe this is feet above sea level. If I click on one of the green pixels it has an elevation of 179 feet above sea level, okay? So the white and brown regions are at a higher elevation and the green, uh, the green regions are at a lower elevation. And what we're looking at here is essentially just the elevation of the terrain around kind of the Austin, San Antonio area. Okay, are there any questions about this data set? Cool. So what we're gonna do today is something that is really important in stormwater engineering and hydrology. We're gonna figure out how to create a watershed 
from digital elevation data. So we're going to show how we can delineate a watershed using digital elevation data. Okay, so this is a really fundamental thing in stormwater engineering. It's often really important to know what your contributing area is for a given channel or stream. And this is how we usually do it, is by analyzing digital elevation data. Okay, any, any questions before I move on? Okay. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to take this digital elevation raster and we need to figure out for each pixel what neighboring pixel would water flow to if the water landed on that pixel. Okay, so essentially we're finding for each cell in this digital elevation model, which direction will water flow to if it falls on that cell. And we can do that using the flow direction tool. Okay, so to do that, let's go to analysis up here in this ribbon. I'm gonna click on tools and let's go ahead and delete this. I'm gonna go look for it under toolboxes. So I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna click on toolboxes. And what we're gonna to need to look for is the spatial analyst tools. Okay, so let's find spatial analyst tools. In order to do this, you'll have to have spatial analyst toolbox uh, enabled. If you don't, um, Becky can help you out in enabling it. Um, so we're going to go under spatial analyst tools. Then we're going to go under hydrology. Then we're going to go to flow direction. Okay, sorry, it, it uh, did that very quickly. So we're under spatial analyst tools hydrology, flow direction. Okay. Is anyone having trouble finding this tool? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and, I'm gonna go ahead and click on it. Okay, so for the input surface raster, we're going to have it use the Austin DEM small dot tip. Okay. So it's asking for a DEM. And the output flow direction raster, let's just leave the name as the default. So it'll output a raster called flow dir ost1. All of the other parameters we're gonna leave by leave to its default. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit run. And what it's gonna do is it's going to create a new raster where each pixel represents the direction of flow that water will flow to from each cell. Let me go ahead and do that. And it's a relatively small raster, so it should complete pretty quickly. Okay, and what it created was a new raster with the flow direction for each pixel. So let's go ahead and uh, just inspect, if we zoom in, each one of these pixel values now represents a flow direction. Okay, so you'll see numbers here from one to two to four, eight, 16. So let me just explain what these numbers are. Each one of these numbers represents a direction um, from east to southeast to south to southwest and all the way around clockwise. So if you go and look at the documentation for ArcGIS, um, essentially one represents east, two represents southeast, four represents south, eight represents southwest, and so on all the way to 128. Okay, so this data set is giving us the direction of flow that a drop of water will flow to based on the path of steepest descent between the neighbors. Okay, are there any questions on the flow direction raster? Yes. Because it has to represent it has to represent it as a numeric value. So we're talking, this is a uh, you have to think about it like a computer would think about it, right? So each one of those directions has to have some numeric value associated with it. There is a reason why they use powers of two, and I can explain that after class, but it essentially has to do with adding different combinations of those numbers together and giving a unique result. Okay, yes. It is possible to change the colors. Uh, so you can go into the symbology. Uh, you can go into symbology and manually change the color scheme. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, I'll change it to these pink colors here. I don't know if that really helps anything, but- uh, 
Right. So yeah, you can you can change the color scheme if you wish. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna change it to something a little bit easier to read here. Uh, I'll change it back to the original. Okay. Great. So, uh, was anyone not able to compute the flow direction raster successfully? Yes. Yes. Okay. So if I could uh, just get it a little bit quieter in here so that I can um, so that I can explain what I did again. What I did was I went to tools. I went to the spatial analyst tools, hydrology, flow direction. And for the input surface raster, I selected the DEM, the digital elevation model. So that's Austin DEM small dot tiff. The output name, you can make whatever you want, but I just left it as the default. And uh, flow direction type, I left as the default, which is D8, which means eight different flow directions. Okay, is anyone having any trouble computing the flow direction raster? No, we're good. Okay, so there's basically two more steps we need to do to successfully delineate a watershed. The next step is we need to compute what's called the flow accumulation. And this is going to tell us where the rivers and channels are essentially in our digital elevation model. Okay, so to do that, we're gonna follow a similar process. Let me zoom out a little bit. Okay, to do that, we're gonna go through a similar process. I'm gonna to go to tools. Uh, I'm still in the hydrology toolbox. And now I'm going to go to flow accumulation. For the input flow direction raster, what do you think we're going to put in? The flow directions, yes. So I'm going to put in flow dir ost1. That's what it's called on my machine. Uh, and it's going to output a flow accumulation raster. The rest of these I'm just going to leave as their defaults. OK. Let's go ahead and compute it. OK. And we get something that looks like this. So great. What do you think this squiggly line is right here? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So I'm going to make this a little bit easier to see. I'm going to go to some. I'm going to uh, right click on this flow accumulation raster that we created, and I'm going to go to symbology. For the color scheme, I'm going to change it to. You can select your own color scheme, but you want something that's kind of gradually varied like this one. So I'm going to choose plasma. I just like this color scheme. And let me turn off these other layers. And for the stretch type, this is important. So instead of percent clip, I'm going to choose histogram equalize. Okay, and this kind of log scales the colors so that you can see the smaller rivers better. Okay. Yeah, so I went, I clicked on flow accumulation over here on the left. I went to symbology. For the color scheme, it's not necessary to change it. Uh, what I did was under stretch type, I changed it from percent clip to histogram equalize. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what this flow accumulation raster actually is. What the, what the flow accumulation raster gives you is it gives you the number of cells upstream of a given cell for each pixel in the raster, okay? So let's, let's zoom in. So these bright colors represent cells or pixels for which there are many, many cells upstream of that pixel. So if I go in and I click on one of these yellow ones, you'll see that the number of pixels upstream of this pixel is about 559,000. If I click on one of these purple pixels here, you can see the number is much smaller. So there's only about 11 cells that are upstream of that cell. And if I click on one of these kind of lighter purple colors, you'll see it's somewhere in between. So about uh, 149, uh, sorry, 1,492 cells. So you can actually look at you know, maybe let's go and look at a river that we know of in Austin. So I'm gonna go and look at Shoal Creek and let's see how much accumulation Shoal Creek has. So this is Shoal Creek here. 
uh, you can see it has about you know four four to five thousand pixels upstream at the outlet of Shoal Creek. Okay, great. So we're almost there. Um, you should get about I think by the end of this you should get about thirty minutes to work on the in class assignment. Uh, are there any questions about the flow accumulation raster before I move on? Any questions? Okay. Great. So there's one final step we need to do to delineate a watershed. Let's pick a watershed here. Um, I'm going to pick uh, Onion Creek right here. I think this is Onion Creek. And let's go and delineate this watershed. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to Tools. I'm going to go to tools and then under hydrology, there will be a tool called watershed. Okay. Under hydrology, there will be a tool called watershed. I'm going to click on watershed. It's asking for the input D8 flow direction raster. So which raster do you think I need to put in here? Yeah, flow dir ost one. Okay. And then it's asking for what's called a pore point. Does anyone have any idea what that is? Yeah, so starting, so that is that is correct. If you think about how it's computed on a computer, what it's essentially asking for is the point at the outlet of the watershed. Okay, so we're gonna do that. I'm gonna zoom in. I'm gonna pick one of these, um, it's kind of like a, like a vein here. Uh, what I'm gonna do is under input raster or feature pore point data, I'm gonna select our pore point. So I'm gonna go over here to this pencil here over on the right. I'm gonna click on the pencil and I'm going to select points. And it will change my icon to a little pin. See this pin here? And I'm going to put the pin on one of these areas where the flow accumulation is high. So let's, let's pick right here. OK, so I selected a outlet point. Now, for the pore point fields, this actually has to be selected as object ID. I don't know why but it needs to be selected as object ID in ArcGIS, okay? So I'll just give you a second. So you should have essentially a pin placed where you want your outlet to be. Your input D8 flow direction raster is going to be flow dir ost1. And your core point field needs to be object ID. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hit run and it will delineate the watershed at that point. Okay, so this is a kind of a big watershed, so it might take a little bit to compute. Okay, and there we go. So there is our watershed. Let's zoom out. So this is a pretty big one. Yeah, so this is Onion Creek. This is probably the biggest watershed in the Austin area. Um, and it's also one of the most flood prone in Austin as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and turn off these other layers. So we've delineated a watershed. You can see it covers you know, a, a good amount of Southern Austin um, and some cities kind of to the South of Austin as well. So um, this is the Onion Creek watershed. You can kind of verify that just by going to the outlet here and looking at what it's named on the map. Uh, so this becomes Onion Creek. Yep, so this is Onion Creek. Well, so what that tells you is that essentially every point in this watershed flows to this outlet here. Okay. So that is the definition of a watershed. Okay. And this is how you delineate one. Yes. 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 It'll be part of the same watershed, but it'll be smaller. So. Um, you can verify that if you want. Uh, you can pick a point up here, for instance, and it will be a subset of that watershed. Okay. Okay. So that was kind of the main thing I wanted to show you today. There's a couple extras I'm just going to go through briefly. I want you to get about 30 minutes to work on the activity, but these Extra lessons will be helpful for you. So I'm gonna go through them a little bit fast, but you will need them for the in-class activity. Uh, the first is, uh, let's say we want to compute the area of this watershed. 
So what we can do is under toolboxes, we can go to raster to polygon. I'm going to select raster to polygon. For our input raster, I'm going to select watershed, watershed flow one. And I'm going to go ahead and hit run. So I'm going to go through this a little fast. If you have questions, I'll come around and help you. Okay, and so that changes our raster watershed into a vector watershed. So you can see that this is all now a single shape. And it gives us the shape area, but what units is this in? Does anyone know? Does anyone know how to find out? So let's check the properties. I'm gonna go under source. I'm going to go to spatial reference. Okay. And our units are in degrees, latitudes, longitude. So this is not super helpful uh, in computing the area of the watershed. What we can do is we can project, we can project our vector data set to a new coordinate system. So I'm going to go under tools, geoprocessing, project. I'm going to take our input data set, um, raster T, watershed one. This is the vector data set we just created. And I'm going to choose an, a projected output coordinate system. So I know I'm going through this fast. I will come and help you with this uh, individually. For the output coordinate system, I'm going to click this little globe here. And I'm going to go to projected coordinate system. Uh, I'm just going to kind of pick one. I'm going to go to continental North America and I'm going to select, uh, let's see here, uh, USA contiguous Albers equal area conic. Let's just pick that one. Okay, so I'm going to hit OK and run. Okay, and it projected our. Uh, watershed to a new coordinate system. So if I go to properties, you can see that the units are now in meters. And if I right click and go to attribute table, you can find the shape area here in square meters. Okay, so I will go help you with this individually. I know I went fast. There's one final thing I wanna do. And then I'm going to let you go work on the in-class activity. And that is how to actually create a nice map layout. Okay, I'm going to show you how to create a nice map layout. So we have this watershed here. Let's go ahead and make a nice looking map that you can print out. Um, okay, under insert up here in the ribbon, I'm going to go to new layout. I'm going to select letter paper. OK, and now the layout works very similarly to how AutoCAD works, if you've ever used AutoCAD. So we're going to create a frame to view the map. So I'm going to go over here to Map Frame up here under Insert Map Frame. I'm going to just select Default Extent. And then I'm going to draw a rectangle containing our map frame. OK, and by default, it's just going to show the entire planet. Uh, we don't want that. So uh, we want the map of our watershed. So to do that, what we can do is I can right click. And I'm going to select Activate. So this works very similarly to how AutoCAD works if you've used AutoCAD before. I just right clicked on our map, and I go to Activate. Okay, so now we're inside the map and we can zoom in. I'm going to zoom into our watershed here. So I'm going to zoom into our watershed. I probably should have picked a landscape aspect ratio, but that's okay. Uh, so here's our watershed. Uh, now we can uh, make the map look a little nicer here. I'm going to go ahead uh, under layout and I'm going to close, activate. Actually, no, I don't want to do that yet. Um, let's go to insert. Wait a second. No, I think I do need to do that. Yeah, close activation. Okay. 
So now I'm back under insert. I'm gonna put in a north arrow. So this is under insert, north arrow. You generally want the north arrow on your maps. You can also create a scale bar. There we go. And now we got a nice map that we can print out. Very nice. Okay. So uh, with that, I will let you go ahead and work on the in-class activity. Uh, it is due Friday evening, but you should have enough time to complete it today. It essentially uh, kind of covers all the things we've talked about. So I will give you the next, uh, until the end of class to work on that, right? All right, thank you. Yes.